Today, I'm going to give a lecture on water pollution. This is based on chapter 18 in your book. And uh, we only have, I think, two more lectures after this, and then that's it, two more weeks of class. So we're wrapping things up. I wanted to say that all of you, are, pretty much all of you are doing really well on your case studies. And what's really encouraging is that they're improving with each one. The grammar's getting better, your logic is getting better, you're thinking through things better, and that's encouraging. So, first of all, when we talk about water pollution, let's think about what do we use water for? What are the primary functions for water in our lives? And one of the obvious ones is drinking. We use it to drink, and obviously we want very clean water or drinking water. We also use water uh, for recreation, pools, lakes, rivers, we, we, we use water a lot for those kinds of things. And then, of course, we use it for agriculture to water our plants and, and crops. And finally, we use it for sewage treatment. Uh, nowadays, we have a sewage system so we can process the sewage. Now, the, one of the challenges that we face with water is that the pollution comes from so many different sources. We call these diffuse sources. For example, we get pollution from the runoff of the streets the oils from the car and the rubber from the tires, the water picks up the dirt and so forth and goes into the gutters and goes into our water system. Agriculture produces a lot of pollutants, uh, pesticides and fertilizers and so forth. And we have industry that's generating pollutants as well as accidents like oil spills. And finally, we have atmospheric deposition. So what that means is that there are pollutants in the air that settle down on the water. One of the things that we want to focus on right now is groundwater contamination. Your project for this week is a groundwater scenario, although it's not about pollution so much, but it's about groundwater. And groundwater is affected by a number of sources, uh, primarily from agriculture uh, with pesticides and fertilizers, but also manufacturing with industrial waste. Let's talk for a minute about your project, your writing assignment. Now, in this particular case, you're dealing with an area where they have a lot of groundwater that's being used by farmers and they've dug their own wells and they're pumping the water out of the ground and the water table has been dropping. When I was a young boy uh, growing up in Arizona, um, I could go into the empty field next door to our house and dig a hole two feet deep and it would fill full of water because the water table, even though it was desert, the water table was about a foot and a half or so below the ground level and the water would seep in and fill up my forts. It wasn't a great area for, uh, for making uh, forts in the ground. But um, as time went by, that water table dropped to several hundred feet as agriculture drained more and more of the water out. And also the rivers had been dammed uh, to avoid flooding. And that was the source of a lot of yeah, the groundwater. The, uh, th this became an issue and they started uh, reducing the amount that was allowed to be pumped out of the ground. And as they did, the water table came back up. And the last time I checked, it was only a foot or two below the surface. Now you're dealing with a situation in your case study where the farmers have drained the water table significantly to the point where they're getting sinkholes. And you can do some reading online about sinkholes or in the textbook, but uh, a sinkhole is caused where the water has uh, been drained out of the underground areas. You can think of them almost like a sponge. And when you take the water out, it can collapse. When I was uh, in Israel several years ago uh, at the behest of the Israeli government, I was taken by a guide down to the Dead Sea. And I'd always imagined the Dead Sea as being a particular having a particular look and it was beautiful but it with the water level the water level was very low and um, the picnic areas were all closed off because there were sinkholes and what had happened was the two countries on each side of the dead sea were competing for the water again you have a common pool resource they were draining the water for its mineral content and making cosmetics and so forth out of it and the water had drained so far that the Dead Sea actually looked like two different seas. And the result was that the water table had dropped sufficiently that, they, that these sinkholes were developing and 
Many of them were in the picnic grounds. I was able to swim in the Dead Sea and have that experience of floating on top of the water, but, but uh, it, nevertheless, the sinkholes were there. So you have a situation now where there's sinkholes in this farmland and you have a county government that wants to deal with this problem and you've been assigned to come up with a solution. So you need to think a lot and deeply about this. I'm not gonna give you any more coaching, but be creative. Think about all the different ramifications of property rights, of regulation, and all the different choices you have. See if you can come up with a really great solution. Uh, let's talk for a minute about ocean pollution. So we know that ocean pollution has become an issue. Mostly in the past, we've heard about oil spills and there's a whole history of oil spills. Now, let's talk about that for just a minute because in the 1970s, we were having a large number of oil spills and some very large oil spills, significantly large amounts of oil being spilled into the oil, into the ocean from one vessel. Now, after that peak in the 1970s, it has dropped dramatically more and more and more and more and more. And the regulation didn't go into place until 1990 and then shortly after that. But by then the oil spills had dropped dramatically to the point where there hardly were, were hardly any left. Um, we've had one recently, a big one, but it wasn't caused by the ships. It was caused by the break in a pipe on an oil rig. Now, the, um, the question is why have the oil spills dropped so much when in fact we're using more oil? And that's something that we need to think about, but maybe if you think about it for a minute, you'll realize that regulation isn't the only way to, to stop these kinds of things from happening. What it turns out is that it was private property rights that did it. You see the farmers, uh, I mean the, the landowners uh, along the uh, ocean had oil coming up onto their shores, damaging their shores and their habitat. And they were able to sue the oil companies for large amounts of money, billions of dollars for the cleanup and uh, the damage that was done. In addition, the fishermen in those areas uh, had lost their livelihood and they were able to sue the oil companies in court because that was their property. They had property rights to it, uh, which had been given to them by the state. And, uh, and the oil company had damaged it. So you can see that in this particular case, property rights actually did more to incentivize the oil companies to fix the problem than regulation. It turns out that the oil companies recognizing that they had billions of dollars at risk were busy trying to come up with solutions to change the way their boats were built so that this wouldn't happen anymore. And they did. Uh, the regulation, it seems, always follows the natural solution to things. Now, getting back to ocean pollution, of course, we also have the problem of trash being dumped in the ocean. We, we hear about the problem of plastics, um, plastic bottles and six pack holders and so forth getting into the ocean. And that is an issue um, that's been being considered as well. So we, here's a case where we need to think about fund pollution and stock pollution. So the fund pollution in the ocean would be those things that are biodegradable and have uh, that the ocean has the absorptive capacity to handle those those kinds of pollutions. So, you know, pollutions do get into the ocean from runoff and, and other things, but the ocean fairly quickly absorbs it and we don't see much damage being done. But uh, there also is stock pollution. In this case would be non-biodegradable uh, substances uh, or plastics and so forth. And also accumulations, for example, of heavy metals heavy metals are being uh, like lead, cadmium, and, uh, and uh, mercury are being absorbed into the fish and the habitat in the ocean. And that's a, a real threat, not only to them, but also to us. I'd like to talk to you for a minute about drinking water. Uh, drinking water is something that we all have to deal with. And, and uh, to be honest with you, I don't drink much water out of the tap. Um, I use bottles and have for many, many years. But uh, drinking, clean drinking water is something really significant. And I've talked to you a little, bit, a little bit about this in the past, that the life expectancies of countries up until about 1910, 1920 were very low. For example, the US in 1910 life expectancy was about 42 on the average. 
Now, by 1936, we'd gotten it up to 66, so that was a huge improvement. And today, it's over 70. So we've seen a big improvement in life expectancy. And the primary reason for this is clean water. Clean water makes such a difference. And, um, and, and throughout the world, what we've discovered is that by providing clean water to the various countries, um, we're making the difference in life expectancies and, uh, and changing the world. Let's talk a little bit about the history of regulations. I don't expect you to memorize any of these regulations because frankly, you can just look them up if you need to, but be aware that there are a number of them. The first regulation that uh, you want to know about is one that was passed in 1899. You might be thinking, who, was cared, who cared about clean water in 1899? Well, this wasn't about clean water. This was the Refuse Act. The Refuse Act was passed because people were dumping very large uh, things into, into the uh, rivers. Uh, old uh, cranes and, and piles of bricks and barbed wire and all kinds of stuff was just being dumped into the river and it was affecting the navigation of the rivers. So this was an act to stop large objects from being put in the rivers and to harm navigation. The second uh, act that was passed was not until 1948, and that was the Water Pollution Control Act. Um, didn't have much teeth in it, but uh, it was the beginning of people thinking about it. And then just eight years later, they passed a new version of the Water Pollution Control Act. This provided federal funding for water treatment plants and regulations on waste discharge so that uh, it made a really big difference. Uh, this was a, a huge difference in terms of the quality of our drinking water and also the starting the cleaning up of our lakes and so forth. 1965, the Water Quality Act. Um, this set water standards for, this, for the country and uh, made sure that everybody had clean water no matter where they lived. Now, let me just tell you a quick little story about clean water. When I was living in Australia, um, one of the places I lived, which was up in the Northeast, was a relatively small town. We lived right on the ocean. Uh, I could walk out my front door across a small, small street and I would be on the beach. It was a pretty nice place to live. It was beautiful, they were tropical. But um, I remember that the water didn't taste very good but we didn't have any choice because there really wasn't water, bottled water available to us. So we drank the tap water. And then one day I decided to take a bath. So I plugged the tub and I turned the water on and I left and I came back in a few minutes and the tub was dark brown. I couldn't see the bottom of the tub. And I thought, oh, that's disgusting. These pipes probably haven't been used for a little while or something. And so I drained it out and ran it some more and some more and some more and I realized no, this is the way the water is here. I checked into it and it turns out that um, that is the standard water in that town. So I got a big uh, pitcher and, and the, from the tap and I filled it full of the water. And when I did, I could see how dark it was. And I let it set for about three or four days and it didn't settle. So this was something that was in the water and was not gonna come out. Um, it was disgusting. So we ended up having to boil the water and try to do it the best we could. This act in 1965 uh, required the states to implement plans, come up with plans and implement plans to improve the water quality. Okay, so in 1972, uh, not very long ago, at least to me, uh, they passed the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act. Uh, this was the first act to regulate dumping in the ocean. So prior to that time, barges and so forth would go out to the ocean dump all kinds of garbage and trash into the water and then come back. It was very inexpensive for them. Of course, this caused all kinds of problems with uh, po poisons and heavy metals and other things getting into, our, into the oceans. So 1972, we passed that regulating that. Then in 1974, the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, this increased the standards, made them a lot more stringent on the drinking water to make sure that uh, the American population was getting good, clean water. We have amazing water in this country. As I've traveled, for example, when my wife and I went down to Nicaragua, traveled around the country there, the people there are so poor. It's the second poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. Only Haiti is poorer. And uh, we were warned 
don't drink water. Don't drink any of the water down there. You'll be in big trouble. So we would buy bottled water and soft drinks. And we stayed at the Intercontinental Hotel, which was in the American area, which was a very, very highly rated hotel and had wonderful food. We could get our bottled water there. Um, but as we traveled around, our son, who speaks fluent Spanish, was kind of our guide and our driver. Um, he and our driver would communicate with each other. We had no idea what they were talking about. But uh, we, we went to visit different people in small villages and so forth. And in one particular village, they offered to give us something to drink. And we said, uh, no, thank you. And they said, oh, no, no, we have bottled water. We said, oh, okay. So they brought us some horchata that had been made from, quote, bottled water. But my son happened to look around the corner and he was noticing that they were filling up the bottles from the tap um, for the bottled water. And so it was a little too late for us. Um, I got violently ill from the bacteria and so forth that was in the water. That doesn't make for a very fun trip. But the point is that here in America, we have incredibly safe drinking water. And this makes such a difference in our lives. So in 1990, they passed the Clean Water Act and Oil Pollution Act. Now, as I said, this was the first act to regulate oil spills. So they decided, the government finally got involved and said, we're going to tell the uh, oil industry how they're going to uh, fix their ships and so forth so we don't have these oil spills anymore, and we're going to pr pr provide fines and so forth. Now, the, uh, the fact of the matter is, it had almost no impact on the number of oil spills because the numbers had already dropped to almost nothing. As you can see from the graph uh, that I showed you earlier, and, and now again, uh, what a dramatic difference it's made. But this almost entirely came from private property rights and the ability to litigate in the courts. Now, um, so in wrapping this up, as you're working on this particular assignment, I want you to think about how water tables work. You see the water under the ground is one very large table of water. The water moves around just like a lake under the ground. And so if somebody drains water in one place, it lowers the level of the water table all over the county. And, and as each of them do this, they, they get more and more of it gets lower and lower. So for a long time, this water table, this underground water was like fishing in a lake. It was a, a common resource that anybody felt like they could use. And uh, so you have, you have to think about that. How do you solve the common pool resource problems? You have to think about uh, how do you allow that water table to rebuild? It's going to take time. Um, obviously, there is water coming in, but if you're taking out faster than it's going in, you're depleting it. So it's a replenishable resource normally, but by pumping out the water too fast, it is becoming a depletable resource. Again, use these terms properly and do well on this paper. I have great expectations. Now, a reminder, I did put up instructions on how to turn on all the grammar checking in Word. Make sure you do this because I'm gonna open your document and I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna look at it. I've had a couple of students who, or at least one student who got frustrated and just turned it off um, on the paper so that when I opened, I didn't see any errors. But of course, when I turned it back on again, I found all the problems. This is an important time for you to learn how to write a technical paper and write well. Um, there's no guarantees. Some of you need to read your papers out loud yourself. Some of you need to have somebody to read them to you um, or to just read them and make comments, but do it right. These are important papers for your portfolio. They can help you in your job search. So make sure that you improve them and keep working on them. And uh, if you have any issues or any problems, make sure you come to my office hours. All you have to do is just email me and say, I'd like to have some office hours and I'll turn it on and we can visit face to face. Good luck.